Heavenly Father, we thank you for your mercy. God, we thank you for this new year that you've given us. Another year to dedicate to you, to pursuing you, to being faithful to you. God, another year to be reminded that you have set aside our sins on Christ and that we can walk in newness of life. You know, we long for when all things are made new and, and the new heavens and the new earth are here, but until then, we, we thank you for this gift of a new year. God, I pray that this word would change us, would conform us to your son, that we would not hear it blandly and, and simply, but we'd hear it for the beauty and the glory that's in it and that the weight of the word would bear on us in the power of the Spirit. And Jesus, move among your church today. Amen. What is church? What is church? That has been a, a discussion that has gone on for, for many years, thousands of years. What, what is church? But it's also something that's come up uh, quite often in the past two years in, in a unique way. What is church? What marks a church? What defines a church? The, the fancy theology word is ecclesiology. You know, ecclesiology, because the Greek word for church is ecclesia. And so, the, so if you're looking up and you're looking at a theological dictionary and you want to find out and you want to do all this research, you look at ecclesiology. But uh, men have, have spent many years in, and, and have spent a lot of paper writing and trying to understand what is the church? What is, what is its design? You know, how, how do you know when you're actually looking at the church? What is the purpose of the church? Why does it exist? What, what is the function of the church? What is the organization of the church? Now, in one sense, when you go and you go on Google and you type in search and on the search bar and you write church, what you're probably going to find is that it's going to bring up a map and it's going to show you the nearest churches to your current location. But we're not talking about a building, although, yes, um, we define this building as a church building. In reality, the church is not the building, but the church is something more particular and more special and something eternal. Even the great cathedrals come tumbling down at some point. Some, even over the course of history, have tumbled even before they are finished being built. And even a, a lovely brick building like this at some point is going to fade. You know, we just recently had a severe earthquake, and you can see in different parts of the building where there's cracks or there's shifting. It just takes enough movement of the earth to demolish this building. Yet Christ says, nothing will prevail against my church. Nothing will defeat my church. Nothing will resist the advancing of the church. Certainly, he was talking about more than a beautiful building made of brick and wood. Certainly, he was talking about something eternal and not temporal. So what is the church? Well, in short, we're going to see in this text a little bit, we're, we're, not, we're not to my main point yet. We're not to what the thrust is, but we need to understand, well, the church is a pillar and buttress of truth. The church is a pillar and buttress of truth. So we look even in this physical building, there are things that are here to hold up the building, and they are there for safety, but they're also there for beauty and glory. But also, we need to understand not just what is the church, but we need to ask, well, what is the implication of the church being a pillar and buttress of the truth? So if it's a pillar and buttress of the truth, I mean, that, that's, that seems rather significant. It's important to have a roof held up. It's important to have a building held up. But to have the truth on a pedestal of the pillar, to, to have it have its foundations and to have the church called as the pillar and buttress of the truth, that, that is a significant description of the church. That is not a small description. Some might say, well, isn't the truth the pillar and buttress of the church? And we'll see, we'll understand how, what, this, what this means, but, but we need to think, what are the implications of the church being a pillar and buttress of truth? And this is what I want us to think, and this is what I want us to, to cling to and hold to as we consider this text and as we dig into it and understand it. But this is the, the main idea, the thought that I want us to draw and to, to consider. Members of God's house, members of God's house, and I'll explain what that is, but 
members of God's house are duty bound. Are duty bound. Members of God's house are duty bound. Not lightly, not encouraged, but there's a tight binding. They're duty bound to live godly lives. If you consider yourself a Christian, you're a member of God's house. And if you're a member of God's house, you are duty bound to live a godly life. So there's a lot to think about and to, and to consider in this text and, and to pull on. But just think about this in these terms. For the church member, for the churches to live godly lives, that is a noble task. If someone gave you a noble task, an honorable task, something that would, that would cause you to say, man, that deserves respect and honor. And if there's anything in the world, it would be to live a godly life in the house of God. Well, so what does it mean? What does it mean to be a member of God's house? Because it says right here, he says, I have come to you and, and I, I hope to come soon, but I'm writing these things so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God. So one ought to behave in the household of God, meaning that there are those who are inside the household of God, which means God has a household, which means that household has members. So what does it mean to be a member of God's house? That you've been adopted. From the get-go, that, that before we can move beyond and understand this, we need to go straight to the gospel here. We need to understand the gospel. To be a member of God's house means that you must be regenerated. You must be given new life. The Holy Spirit must come and, and must move. As we read in John chapter 3, the Holy Spirit must move and give you a new birth to impart faith so that you might believe, so that you might be regenerated, so that you might be raised from the dead. And then not just are we raised from the dead to be a member of God's house, but we are actually adopted. We're actually adopted into the household of God. If you would consider this, most of us live in a house of some sort. It might be a house, might be an apartment, might be uh, any other uh, number of, of variations, but there's a house or a home of some sort that we live in. Now, if you took a piece of paper and you wrote down on that piece of paper everyone who lives in that house, in that dwelling, it would have a limited number of people. So maybe you live by yourself and there's one person. Maybe you live with more than one person, there's maybe three, four, five. Now grab a second piece of paper and write a list of people who have come to your house, come to your home. That list is significantly longer, but no one confuses the two. You see, just because you have come to gather and be with God's people, to be uh, around those who are part of God's house, does not mean that you actually live in God's house, that you're a part of God's house. Just because someone visits your house for New Year's Eve does not mean they now are part of your household. You might call them friend, you might call them family, but you also call them to leave at the appropriate time so that you can go to bed. If you woke up in the morning and someone who was not in your house was there, you'd say, what are you doing? The reality is this is the same. This is a, a, a physical reality of something that is spiritually true. Those who belong to God's house are there rightly and not on their own accord, but because they have been invited in by God himself, said, welcome to my household. And the only way that you can enter in is through the work of Christ, through the work of what was done on the cross. And you say, well, I want to be part of the house. I want to enter into that house. Well, this, the simple response to that is say, well, then ask, God, will you take me into your house? I want to be part of your household. Now, you may come from a good house. You may come from a bad house. You may come from a good family or bad family. But the reality is it doesn't matter what your family is. The family of God is so much greater. And so you say, God, I, whether or not I like my family or love my family, I see your family and I want to be part of your family. God, will you welcome me in? And you know what the joy is? If someone came to your house today and said, hey, can I live at your house? Can I, can I live there? You would say, well, I need to think through something. There might be legal things. You know, if you have an apartment, you might have to check with your landlord. Or, you know, if you, you know, have only a few rooms, you'd have to consider what's the impact. Or you might be like, I don't know if I want to live with you. Right? I mean, there's, there's all sorts of things that could go into if someone said, can I live in your house? But this is the great and gracious thing about God. When you can say, God, I want to live in your house. He doesn't say, well, come back in a couple days and let me think through this. 
But he says, welcome. Welcome. And the strange thing is that offering has been made to any and to all, and yet only a few actually respond to that call. And you see that in the parable of the great wedding feast. How do you become a member of God's house? Well, you're regenerated and you're adopted into the household of God. You have a father who will never leave you or forsake you. You have brothers and sisters. You have mothers. You have sons and daughters in the household of God. And this is a beautiful thing. And Timothy is receiving this letter from Paul, and Paul is saying, I'm writing to you so that you may know how one ought to act in that household. All of us have rules in our house. I bet if we all sat down and wrote the rules to our house and then compared them, they'd be different rules, but we all have rules to our house. Some houses, you gotta take your shoes off when you're in the front door. Some house, you can wear your shoes. Some house, you're allowed to um, write on the walls. I don't know what house that is, but other houses be like, do not write on my walls, right? Some, some houses, you can, you can do certain things this way or certain things that way, but every house has rules. There's a distribution of chores. Who cleans up? Who does not clean up? Who's supposed to clean up? Who didn't clean up and is now in trouble because they didn't clean up? Who pays the bills? Who ensures that the the lawn is mowed? Every every house has responsibilities, and everyone is supposed to behave in a certain way. You know, the old phrase, I know your mom didn't raise you like that. Why? She raised you in a particular way to live a certain way in her house, in your house. In the same sense, you have rules for your house. We don't live that way. We don't behave that way. We don't act that way. And in the household of God, there are very clear lines of this is how we behave, this is how we do not behave. And Paul, in his kindness and his mercy, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says, I have written these things so that if I am delayed, you know, because he doesn't know, he doesn't know, he's not the guarantee of the future. He says, so I'm, I'm giving this in case I'm delayed, that way you know how to behave. And so we, he gives this, and he says, but it's, so that one might know how to behave in the household of God. And then and it says, which is the church of the living God? So what is the house of God? What is that household of God? The word there for house can carry the idea of the physical building or rather the familial ties, the family ties of that household. So in, in, in the ancient Near East world, that would include a, a father and a mother, but it might also include living with some in-laws or your parents, depending on the relationship. It would include kids. It could include, include um, the, the son-in-laws or daughter-in-laws in that sense. It, it would also often include a master's or servant relationship. You'd have the servants would be counted as part of the family or counted the household And so we ask, well, what is this household of God? Well, we see that the household of God is the church of the living God. Church comes from that Greek word, as I mentioned earlier, ekklesia. Ekklesia. And ekklesia is real important that we understand this word because the word ek right there is out of. Ek, out of. And klesia comes from that word kaleo, which means called. It's a compound word. Ekklesia is a compound word taking out of and called, meaning when you put it together, the ekklesia is the called out ones. Church is not, ecclesia is not a religious term in the ancient Near East. In, ancient, in the ancient world, in the New Testament times, it wasn't a religious term. At one point in Athens, the entire community was considered part of the ecclesia. At one point in Athens, you would have city meetings, and you see an example of this even in Acts, uh, not at Athens, but somewhere else, that you, you would see where they would call out the people of the city, and everyone were, was able to participate in the discussion of that meeting, of what was going to happen, but only the people that were actually physically present were the ecclesia. And so an ecclesia in the, in, the, in the Greek and in the ancient world always, always, always carries a physical reality with it. There is no use apart from the universal church, which still carries a physical reality, there is no use in the ancient world of the ecclesia being anything but a physical gathering, a physical calling out, a, a, a physical coming together of people. So when people in our modern time say, I can go to church online, is stupid. It, it's, it's nonsense. It doesn't make sense. That's like saying, I can go to orange online. It doesn't make sense, John. I know because I'm using orange wrong. Ecclesia is something that you must come to. 
It's not something that you have an intellectual experience or a spiritual experience, and you say, well, I'm there in spirit. Well, you may be there in spirit, but you're not there. Even Paul knew that distinction. I can't be with you, but I'm with you in spirit. But he was not there. The ecclesia is a gathering of God's people. If all of your body parts, I know this is not how it works, but if all your body parts do not show up for work in the morning, you know, and you're, oh, I have to go pick up my hand over there, and I have to go pick up my foot over there, and I, man, I really hope my knee makes it today. You know, th this, this is not how the body works. The body is physically present. If a body part is missing, there's a severe problem. What is the household of God? It is, a, is the church. But it also says that it's a pillar and a buttress of the truth. Now, pillar is, is kind of what we think. Pillar is this thing, the column-like thing, a cylinder. It holds up and it, and it holds up stuff. And you can kind of think ancient Roman world. I don't know if you, you know, studied that. They've got different types of pillars and what the top and the bottom looks like and how big they are and, and what they do and how they're made. Uh, oftentimes, they're made out of marble and, and massive things as well, not just small pillars. Today, you can go to, you know, go to a, um, a, you know, a, a local uh, home store and, and go buy a small pillar. You know, a small, I mean, we're not talking, we're talking these are big, beautiful, massive things holding up big, massive parts and structures of buildings. And all over the ancient world, you would see pillars. You would understand what a pillar is. But there's this word for buttress. This word for buttress is, is really interesting because this word is only used by the New Testament writers. It's only used once, and it's only used in Christian writings. This word is a made-up word by Christians, in a sense. Christians took a word and changed a little bit so that they could use it as a Christian word. So in, in this word, you would have this idea that it was supposed to be this mainstay, this thing which held together, this thing which was a foundational support, but it was first an idea as a verb, like I'm going to be firm, I'm going I'm to hold fast. But right here, Paul uses it as a, as a noun, and it's not ever used as a noun. He, he takes a verb and he turns it into a noun. That's a big deal in Greek. You don't just flippantly do things like that. And he takes this, this verb and he turns it into a noun. And, and, and then he, he says, this is what we are. So if you remain fast, I'm going to remain fast. Turn that idea, that action into a noun, into a thing. And that's what the church is. The church is not just going to be, remain fixed. The church is a fixture. The church is a steadfast. The church is a firm these things don't make sense. So the, the, the church is, is something that is foundational, does not move strength, and holds up. The pillar holds up and is there for glory and beauty, and it stands there and does not move. The, this, this, so this pillar and buttress it has this idea of building that's put in here, and it's holding up the truth. And we think, man, okay, so the church holds up the truth? Yes, but let me paint the picture of what Paul is doing here. Paul is not saying the church is the pillar and buttress of the truth. He is saying church. He's not using a definite article. He's saying church, meaning the, the church is, every church. And he does not say the pillar. He says is a pillar. So every church is a pillar and buttress of the truth. So go back to Revelation chapter 1, where Jesus is walking among the lampstands. There are multiple lampstands. In the same sense here, there's multiple pillars, multiple buttresses that Jesus is among in a sense. And what is he always doing? Like a good architect, like a good engineer, like a good foreman, like a good manager of his house. He's always going through and looking to make sure that the pillars and the buttresses are doing what they're supposed to be doing. And just like Jesus was willing to remove those lampstands that were no longer doing what they're supposed to be doing, I have no doubt that Jesus is willing to remove a pillar that is no longer sound in its integrity, no longer capable of doing what it's supposed to be doing, and will put in a new pillar in its spot. But there's an interesting idea, if you will. We use illustrations from our modern times, but kind of put your mind in the middle of ancient Ephesus. You're in the middle of ancient Ephesus. Don't know how you got there, you know, but you're there and people don't notice you and you kind of have a lay of the land. You understand what's going on. And you notice that there's this massive temple there in Ephesus. And it's the temple to, um, uh, temple to the goddess Diana. And this temple here with God standing has, has not just a few pillars around the outside, 
that has 127 pillars. 127 pillars. And you notice that each of those pillars are, are not exactly all the same, but they're a little bit different. They're all ornate. They're all beautiful. They, they, they serve a physical, functional purpose, but they also serve a visual beauty purpose. And some are, are very ornate. Some have gold and jewels, and, and, and some are designed lovely. And there's 127 of them, and every single one of those pillars was donated to that temple by a king. There's this sight to see and to observe, and... and and behold. And in a sense, those pillars were holding up the temple of God, that temple of that goddess. But in reality, it was the totality of the pillars together that were holding up that temple. It was not a single pillar that was doing all the work, but every pillar was doing its part to sustain something that is true. The beauty, the, what those um, idolatrous pagans thought was beautiful and glory to a beautiful and glorious goddess, the church does to the true and the living God. They serve the dead goddess, Diana, and we serve the living God. Those pillars were beautiful for a moment and have been since made unbeautiful, but the pillars of the church... Those are forever beautiful, forever glorious. It goes in and, and, and we, we consider, well, what is the church house of God? And it's the ecclesia, it's the pillar, the buttress of truth. And we consider that the pillars were there acting as a pillar of the truth. And we kind of imagine, you know, truth sitting on top of this. But in reality, the, 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 it was a, a, a network. And we say, well, so does the church hold up the truth? In a sense, it holds up the truth. In a sense that as the church is standing, it is declaring the truth to be real but consider something else that is necessary and appropriate to say here, even foundational to the structure, which is the foundation. If you would, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, uh, 1 Corinthians, let me see, sorry. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11, I was right. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 and Paul writing to the church of Corinth that lacked no, uh, uh, no temple itself and had many buildings, he uses this building analogy and he, he says, For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. While we're thinking that the church and the churches are pillars or each a pillar and buttress of the truth, we didn't understand that each of those churches are on a foundation, and that foundation is Christ. So we might say, well, if the church fails, will the truth fail? No. Why not? We know this for two reasons. One, because Christ is the truth. He says, I am the way, the truth, life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Christ is the truth. The truth will never fail because Christ will never fail. But we also know that the the truth will not fail because the church will never fail. Well, how do you know that? And in Matthew chapter 16, what does it say? The gates of hell will not prevail against you. I will build my church. The church is not going to fall. Oh, a church may close. A church may end. There may not be a representation of a church here or there anymore as there once was. But the church will never die. The church will never fail. Do you think Christ died to lose his bride? The church will never fail. The pillars will never fail. And they may falter here and there. They may be the worst for the wear after some weather. But when the grand architect is done with his building, it will be the most beautiful building to behold. The truth will never fail because Christ will never fail. The church will never fail because Christ will never cease to uphold the church. Well, I said that the members of God's house are, are, and so we looked at members and we looked at what the house is, but, what, but I said that the church is duty-bound. Duty-bound, that's a big, fierce word. You're going to tell me I have to be godly? And not just like, hey, be godly, but you, are you telling me, are you saying that I have no option but to be godly? That is exactly what I'm saying. And if you think I'm being too strong, I apologize. My language is not strong enough to declare how bound you are to being godly. Being godly in the house of God is not something you and I get to say, you know, let me see, what ministry do I want to be involved in? Well, I like music, you know, I you know, like bringing food to potlucks. And, you know, I'll try out that godliness thing for a little bit. I'll, I'll try that out. 
if it doesn't work for me, well, then I'll just go, you know, work on this project or that project. Godliness is not something that a Christian or a member of God's house can pick up and set down at their leisure. It is something that we are duty bound to. That word bound is also often found in contrast with, with the verb for, for loose. And it often carries the idea of when you bind something or you loose something, when you tie something or you untie something. And so we're, we're, not, we're not just in a sense of, of we have a good idea that we ought to be godly or that we ought to behave, but we are bound, we are constrained, we are tied, we are compelled to live a particular way in God's house. It's not something we can pick up and set down, but it's something that God has, has designed. And so we might say, well, why are we duty-bound? Well, if you read in, in Revel, uh, sorry, no, Revelation in Romans, you're going to find out that you're either a slave to Christ or a slave to sin. Which means if you're a slave to sin, your master is sin. And if you're a slave to Christ, your master is Christ. And what does a good slave do? What does a good servant do? They obey their master. And what does our master demand of us, command of us, call us to do? But to be godly. We are bound. We are enslaved to live godly lives because of our good master who calls us to. But then even further, we see that we are duty bound um, to live a godly life, to live a particular life because Christ died to redeem sinners. Christ did not die to indulge sinners. Christ did not die so that you could continue sinning. Should I sin all the more so that grace may abound? No, 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 no. So you go and for whatever reason, you're driving down the road and you speed. And a cop pulls you over and says, were you speeding? You say, yeah. And he goes, well, you know what? I'm actually going to pay this ticket for you. I'm actually going to write the ticket out to my name and I'm going to pay it for you and just count it covered. So at that point, we say, man, I really like this police officer. I get to now speed and he pays for my bill. We missed the point. We were given a grace. We were given a gift. We were given a, a, a second chance. And we're like, man, now does that mean that we, you know, do not sin ever again? No, we, we still sin. But there's a difference between saying, I'm going to just put the pedal to the metal and just full-blown sin, indulge myself in sin. And there's a difference between that and saying, I am pursuing godliness and righteousness, and, and the sin just still drags at me and chews at me and gnaws at me. There's a difference between indulging in sin and failing. Christ did not die for you to indulge, but he died to redeem you, to purchase you, to cleanse you. No mom, after washing her child, was excited to see her child playing in the mud again. Our Savior is not excited to see us indulge in sin. We are duty-bound for godliness. Why are we duty-bound? Why are we duty-bound? Is there anything else that we could do in light of what Christ has done for us? Not to secure our salvation, not to earn our salvation, but knowing that we have been freed from the bondage of sin, is there anything that would be more delightful and joyful than to live in obedience to Christ? Well, how do you determine what is godly? Right there, that word for live carries a particular, but it's, it's the idea of living a life of right conduct. It's living a life of, of right behavior, how you ought to live. So it's not just the idea of how you ought to walk about. There's another word in Greek for how you ought to live, how you ought to walk about. But here carries a very particular idea of your behavior, your conduct, your way of life. And says, well, how, how do we determine what is godly? How do we determine how we ought to live? What does Paul say here? I hope to come to you soon, but I am writing these things to you so that you may know. How do we determine how we ought to live? Read the writings that we've been given. Like, read the writings. Have you ever made something? You had instructions, you're like, I don't need instructions. And you go and you just, you just start going to town making this thing. You know, it's a toy for a kid or a project or something. Or, you know, you kind of get something. It's like an electronic piece and you got to put stuff together. And you're about halfway through this thing and it's looking messed up. I mean, it looks like a Picasso at this point. I mean, there's no sense or semblance here. What is going on? And then you're like, hey, has anyone seen those uh, instructions? 
And you pull those out, and you're like, man, who was the guy that started working on this thing? Man, he was an idiot, right? And you realize those instructions were not just randomly given into, like someone just randomly scribbled some things down on a paper and said, well, I hope people ignore this. But they're put, in there, they're put there so that you can actually use them to accomplish the task at hand. God does not say, you know what, I really hope they're godly and I hope they figure it out on their own. No, he has actually revealed to us. He does not leave us on our own to figure it out. If we were left on our own to figure it out, well, we know what happens. We, we, we fail miserably. We, we err miserably. But Christ says, look, I am going to give you Scripture. In, uh, in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, the Scriptures are given to us so that we might know everything that pertains to life and godliness. The Scriptures have been revealed to us. Or you read in Corinthians and talking about the Old Testament. These things were written for you so that you might have an example. Everything in Scripture is written down for us so that we might know how we ought to or not ought to walk. And not so that we can earn our salvation, but so that we can live in, in, in loving and obedient response to what God has done for us. How you determine what is godly, you, you just check the holy writings. Thomas Watson, he was writing about Malachi chapter 3, verse 16 through 18, but he said something about that text. And if it's true of that text, then it is true of this text. Thomas Watson speaking about that. He says, the main design of this excellent scripture, speaking of Malachi, is to encourage solid piety and to confute the atheists of the world who imagine there is no gain in godliness. How, if it is true of that text, talking about the fear of God, how much more so is it when the text is saying, live a godly life? One commentator says the church's duty is to hold up the truth in such a way that men see it. Brother and sister, if you are of Christ, the way that you live reflects the veracity, the truthfulness of the claim that Jesus is who he says he is. If you claim Christ, people are going to then assess your life to see if that claim is true. And you're going to say, well, no, no, don't look at me, look at Jesus. Mm -mm. It's not how it works. And we know that. When someone is a politician, what's the first thing that the opponent does? I need you to find dirt on that politician. I need you to find out about his life. Well, but his policies are good. Yeah, but his life is junk. If, if this is just a, a, a picture, a glimmer of the reality... If people treat worldly things like that, they're going to treat you and I no differently. The world is going to assess your life and my life, believer, brother and sister in Christ. The world is going to assess your life, and they are going to determine whether or not the gospel is true based off of how we live. And that's a heavy weight. That is a weight that only a pillar can bear. Members of God's house are duty-bound to live godly lives. Well, so how do you live a godly life? How do you live a godly life? I mean, we, we know how to determine what, a, what is a godly life, but how do we live a godly life? Well, the first is repent and confess. Regenerate. We, we need to be regenerate believers. I mean, if you want to live a godly life, you're not going to do it apart from Christ. You're not going to do it apart from Christ. 1 Timothy chapter 15. Sorry, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. It says, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus, came into the world to save sinners. You want to live a godly life? You have to be saved. You have to call out to Christ for salvation. Lord, change me. Make me yours. And I want to live a good life. You know, I want to be a good person. You're not going to do that apart from Christ. You're like, well, I'm just going to clean up my life. You're not going to do that apart from Christ. I, I just want to just kind of improve, you know, make some steps, make some steps forward. You're not going to do that apart from Christ. Every person who visits your home does not necessarily belong to your household. Every person who goes to church does not necessarily belong to the household of God. 
And like an elder and overseer who is supposed to manage his household well, God manages his household well. God does not leave strangers in his house overnight. And so let us not be found as strangers in the house of God, but let us be found as family. Let us be found as child of God, not a robber. Two, how do, how do we live a godly life? Two, we need to study. We need to know his word. We need to obey his word. We, and his word, by word, I mean scriptures, his writings. We need to study his word. Calvin, speaking of this text, says, The truth of God is maintained by the pure preaching of the gospel. And then he goes on to say, Silence in the church is the banishment and crushing of the truth. This is why the word ministry is so important in the church, because from the pulpit is the declaration of truth, and then in the lives of the believers and in the mouths of the believers is the, is the, the reverberations of the declaration of that truth. The truth must be proclaimed. It must be declared clearly, rightly, accurately. If, if I speak poorly, Shame on me. I must speak clearly. I must refine my speech, not so that the the glory goes to me, but so that I ensure that I am not confusing anyone. Why? Because the truth is at stake. Would you want someone to confuse you if they were um, if they were teaching you all the stuff you needed to know for driving lessons? Would you want someone to confuse you if they're teaching you all the things you needed to know to build a house? No, you'd want clarity. You would want to know rightly how to do these things. In the same sense, you want to know clearly what is the truth. And, and if the pulpit does not preach the truth, then that pillar will be removed. It is a judgment and a mercy of God when a pastor is removed from the pulpit for sin. Oh, it's an egregious thing and a, and a, and a disastrous thing, but it is, a, it is a mercy and a judgment of God when a pastor who does not preach the word is removed. But at the same time, it is also a judgment of God when a church is left with a pastor that does not preach the word. In the end, there will be those who do not want the truth, but they want their ears tickled, as we read in 2 Timothy. In Amos, we read that there's going to be a famine in the land, not a famine of food and water, but a famine of the truth. The, the word is going to be lacking. The gospel is not going to be proclaimed. And we live in a time where people don't just deny the truth of the gospel, they deny the truth of reality. To say, I, I'm, a, I'm physically born a man, but I'm a female, that, that is, you're denying reality. To say that I'm a mermaid, I mean, this is not made up stuff ago. Uh, Ten years ago, I could say, ha that was funny, we're just making stuff up. But people are saying absolutely atrocious or just inane, crazy things. And it's like, well, who am I to deny that? You're someone who can observe reality, truth. And church, we are called to declare the truth. Who am I to say they're wrong? You are a messenger of truth. Well, how do I know what the truth is? You read the word, you study the word, you hear the faithful preaching of the word, you saturate your mind, you saturate your soul with that which is true. And that which is true is found in Christ, in his word. I am the way, the truth, the life. Then he says that, um, that, that the scriptures say that Christ is the divine word. Christ is the revealed word fully, but we have the scriptures. We don't do this thing, well, we have Jesus, we don't need the Bible now. Jesus quoted the Bible when arguing with Satan. If Jesus, the divine word, the eternal word, quotes scripture to argue with, G with Satan, then you and I ought to prepare ourselves battle with, uh, with Satan and with the enemy by knowing his word. Study, know his word. Three, how, how do we live a godly life? Three, we need to prioritize the church in our life. You need to prioritize the church in your life. Do you know why you get good at something that's interesting to you? Because you prioritize that. The reason why you are good at any given task is because you put that as a priority in your life. Whether it's baking, whether it's cooking, whether it's sewing, whether it's woodwork, whether it's working in the fields, whether it's shooting, whatever hobby you can think of, whether it's your job, whether it's sports, whatever the hobby is, whatever the activity is, whatever the function is, the reason why you're good at it is because you prioritize it. Those who are godly are godly because they prioritize the church. And not just the building, the people. People who are physically fit are usually physically fit because they have prioritized the gym, right? 
if we do not prioritize the church, the ecclesia, the household of God, godliness is going to always remain outside of our grasp. MacArthur, in regards to this passage, says the supreme mission of the church is to uphold the precious legacy of God's word. How can we pursue godliness if we're not with people who desire godliness? You're not going to become more godly hanging out with ungodly people, period. That does not mean that we do not engage and have and care for and, and be considered friends of sinners, but if you prioritize sinners over Christ, godliness is not a priority. Work, sports, recreation, hobbies, culture. But you can even use isolation to avoid the church. I just won't go to church. I won't be around the world, nor will I be around the church. I'll grow in godliness. That's like taking a seed and saying, well, I'm not going to put the seed in the ground in a, in a healthy field, but I don't want to put it in the street because that's going to damage it. I'll just leave it in a dark closet. That seed is not going to grow. How do you live a godly life? Well, do good works. Do good works. I mean, find things that are good. Like, what is good and righteous? Do those things. I mean, you don't have to think too hard. Like, you don't, in a reasonable mindset, should I do this, should I not do that? If you would, consider in, in 1 Timothy chapter 2. You just turn a page back or so, perhaps, but a chapter back. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. And it speaks of, of women here, but this applies for the church and all Christians. In, in second, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 9 and 10, it says, Likewise, also that women should adorn themselves in respectable peril with modesty and self-control, not with braided hair and gold or pearls or costly attire, but with that which is proper for women who profess godliness, with good works. If you profess to be godly and you want to pursue godliness, do good works. Well, what, what's good? And the world is going to like try to make you feel bad that you're not doing something good enough. Christ makes doing good works as simple as if you give a cup of cold water to one of mine, if you give a cup of cold water to a brother or sister in Christ, you just did a good work. You don't have to drop $3 million into some um, you know, goodwill enterprise. Oh, I started this nonprofit entity to do goodwill and to do good works. I'm finally doing good works. You, know, you don't have to have a nonprofit named after you. You don't have to have buildings of orphanages named after you. But when there's someone around you, are like, I, I'm hungry. I mean, it's, it's as simple as, you know, today we're going to have a potluck. It's as simple as there's a little kid next to you and they can't quite reach the napkins. You need a napkin? Here you go. That's, gosh, I really wish I could just do nice things for Jesus. Here's a napkin. Man, what could I do? It's, it's that simple. I mean, there, there's things that simple. Sure, you want to, you, you're endowed with billions of dollars. You want to give away billions of dollars? Sure, great. But there's, you know, a handful of people in the world that do that. But for the rest of the world, you start with the things that you have around you to do. Five, meditate on the truth and confess godliness. Meditate on the truth and confess godliness. Consider, we, we didn't go into this, but consider how Paul follows this thought. He, he, says, he says, the church, which is living God, he says, it is the pillar and buttress of truth. And then what is the next thing that he says? What is the next thing? He says, great indeed we confess is the mystery of godliness. How do we become godly? You meditate on the truth. What is that truth? That he, God, Christ in the flesh, was manifested in the flesh, vindicated by the Spirit, seen by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. You want to be godly, you meditate on who Christ is. Right? I don't know about you, but you, if, you have, if you have good eyesight, this may not be a problem, but I'm sure at certain points. But if you have bad eyesight and you can't quite see something, what do you do? You get closer to it. Right? If, if you want to be godly, Look at Jesus, and we have bad eyesight, spiritually speaking, so we're, I would get a clear view of Jesus. You kind of get closer. You know what happens when you get closer to Jesus? You get more like him. Right? It's just the reality. Proximity is going to increase your sanctification. Verse 
And Jesus says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in their midst. There's no greater be, place to be to get near to Christ than to gather with his people. Sixthly, how, how do you live a godly life? And this is really complex, really difficult. No, it's not. There is a difficulty in it because it feels like you're doing nothing. The way that you, your own godliness, and I know I put it last, but it's probably the most important, apart from asking, well, but, in, but apart from coming and confessing to Christ is, is pray for godliness. Just, God, would you make me godly? Let me start there. I know I put it last, but God, would you make me godly? I desire it, and I really don't know where to start. And those examples Pastor John gave were, well, they just didn't help me. God, would you grow me in godliness? Does God love you? Does he care for you? Does he hear your prayers? And he's going to hear the prayer, God, would you make me godly? He's going to be like, oh, yeah, I'm answering that prayer. Or, God, would you give me a yacht? Right? He's like, you know, God, God, would you, would you, you know, give me the world's greatest job ever? God answers the humble prayers. God, make me patient. God, make, um, make me humble. Give me self-control. He answers those prayers. He says, God, would you make me godly? He answers those prayers real quick. We don't always like the response. We don't always like the answer, but he answers those prayers so quick. It, it endears him to us and us to him. But don't just pray for godliness for yourself. Pray for godliness in the church. Pray for godliness in your brother and sister and pray for godliness in your home. Sanctification is a spirit-dependent and a spirit-empowered activity that is done through prayer. 1 Timothy chapter 4, listen to this. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 6 through 10, it says this. It says, if you put these things before the brothers, so Paul is speaking to Timothy, the things I've just said, but if you put these things before the brothers, you will be a good servant of Christ Jesus, being trained in the words of faith and of the good doctrine that you have followed. Have nothing to do with irreverent, silly myths. Rather, train yourself for godliness. For while body, bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way, as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. For to this end we toil and strive because we have our hope set on the living God who is the Savior of all people, especially of those who believe. Brother and sister, I, I pray that each of you would be godly, but I also pray that each of you would love the church. What a precious gift we have been given. I want you to think and meditate for a moment. In this, while we're singing this song, I want you to think and meditate over the past year. How has God used the church to edify, to build up, to grow, to care for you? And sure, there may have been moments of disappointment. Group this size, there's always going to be someone disappointed at something. But consider, God, how, how, how have you used the church in my life? And then as you consider the words of the song that we sing, give praise to God for what he has done, not just in our salvation, but in this very year. Let us not let a year pass by, a day pass by, where we fail to give thanks to God for growing us in godliness and caring for us in every step of the way. Amen? We stand and let us sing. Or let me pray and then we'll sing. Lord, would you hear our prayers? Would you grow us in godliness? God, would you strengthen this church in godliness? Make this church known for being faithful to you. God, let us not hide our errors and, and lie about who we are, but God, let us be found faithful to you. And God, when we do err, let us be quick to seek forgiveness from one another and from you. And we love you, King Jesus. Amen.